The CONCACAF World Cup qualifying is coming to an end. And the last opponent the United States has to face is Costa Rica away, an opponent that we usually don't have that much luck away. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Engine B, and welcome to the last preview of this World Cup qualifying cycle, because it's the last game, and also the last World Cup qualifying preview in a while, because we're not playing the next cycle, because we're the host nation of 2026, so we're only going to play another World Cup qualifying game at the earliest, 2027, at the earliest, probably 2028. With that said, in this video, we'll tell you where to watch the game, fun facts, any updates on the United States, and we're going to bring a special guest to talk about Costa Rica. And I know this game sounds a little bit meaningless because Costa Rica has to beat us 6-0 for us to drop to fourth place and go play the Interconfederate playoffs against Oceania. And it probably won't happen, but there's a lot to it and we're going to address it in the video. Okay, but that just to make that clear, that's the current situation. Any result from 5-0 below of a loss, the United States is good to go for Qatar. So yes, we're 99.9% there for this video i will count on with the help of eddie from crc football on twitter i'm putting his hand on the description go give him a follow he's a costa rican soccer expert very knowledgeable on the game and at los ticos all right with that said everyone don't forget that wednesday we'll be doing a live watch along we'll be back i didn't do the panama one because of the vlog obviously and pete did a great job taking care of that thank you very much pete from 11 Inks. let's play the intro and let's start with the last world cup qualifying preview of the channel of the year of 2022 man time does fly by The U.S. men's national team is set to face Costa Rica this Wednesday, March 30th, for the last round of World Cup qualifying. This match will be played in San Jose in Costa Rica at the Estadio Nacional, a place where the United States has actually never won a game and brings back bad memories, many bad memories, but this time it could be different. Kickoff is scheduled for 9.05 p.m. Eastern Time, and if you're in the United States, you may watch this match at CBS Sports Network, Paramount+, Plus, Universal, and peacock as well and yes as i said before you can watch here on the channel with us as well on the live watch along at least you can follow my reactions and my commentary which are not that bad they're okay okay so our away record against costa rica is as bad as it gets however with them needing a 6-0 win plus the fact that suspensions are carried on from the world cup qualifying to the interconfederate playoff match costa rica might play a B team or an A minus team. They might not play their key players. We'll talk about that with Eddie very soon. So what I'm trying to say here is if the United States has ever been in a better position to go to Costa Rica and get a win, this is the best one. Costa Rica probably won't play their best players. We're already qualified. Okay, we're not, sorry. We're not already qualified. We're pretty much qualified, right? We can lose 5-0 of them and we'll be qualified. So there's not that much pressure on our players. It almost seems like the perfect storm to finally end this curse and beat Costa Rica in the Stadio Nacional. The last match against Costa Rica in World Cup qualifying was in the United States and we defeated them 2-1 after coming back from being down 1-0 early in the game. We had a good performance in that match to be fair, along with a golazo from Serginho Dest to tie the game in the first half. As for any updates with the United States, Tim Weah and DeAndre Yedlin that served suspension against Panama should be available for this match. In regards to anything else, at the time of this recording, there's no other news and updates. Tyler Adams will be available, Pulisic, all these guys, they should be available, our main players, and the ones that were injured remain injured. Now, this is one thing I do want to address before we bring in Eddie. Personally, I would honestly rest any players that trainers or team doctors think should be rested to prevent an injury. If they're good to go, I would play the best players available and make history. This might be the best moment to do so, in my opinion, and these little moments matter. If you want to change the way the world sees U.S. soccer, it starts in CONCACAF, being as dominant as possible. And I think ending this curse and beating Costa Rica, Costa Rica can be a statement, right? Even though the circumstances are in our favor and it wouldn't be as meaningful as a, a match that had more at stake, even though World Cup is at stake, you guys know what I mean. Them having to beat 6-0, it makes this game have some weird vibes to it. But I would go all in and go for the win for this match. And I actually, despite all the criticism of Greg, I actually think he's going to go for the win. I think. Now, let's bring in our sponsor, NordVPN. Then, we're going to bring Eddie to talk about Costa Rica. We'll talk about the predicted starting 11 of Costa Rica, their story of how they got here, the U.S. predicted starting 11, and maybe our score predictions. 
So now let's hear from NordVPN. Tired of having big tech collecting all your data and spy on you? Well, our sponsor might have the solution to that. NordVPN is the world's best VPN service offering fast connectivity, most servers, and next generation encryption to make sure that everything you do online stays secure. Plus, you can use NordVPN on all your computer and devices no matter the operating system. With NordVPN's unlimited bandwidth, you never have to worry about a slow connection either. And plans start at under $4 per month. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal right now by going to nordvpn.com slash believe. That is believe as in B-L-E-A-V. Use the code for 70% off on your NordVPN plan plus an additional free month. It's also risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. So again, thank you NordVPN for sponsoring the channel. All right, everyone. Today, we have Eddie from CRC Football from representing Los Ticos, Costa Rica for this preview. An unusual preview because it was a game that it seemed like it was going to mean so much for both teams. But it's almost giving a vibe that they almost have nothing to play for. Hi, Eddie. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. So, Eddie, the first thing I want to ask you right away is there was a point in the campaign, and I I'm going to tell you a confession here. I actually thought Costa Rica wasn't going to make it. But now you guys, once again, look like you're very – it's very promising to make it to Qatar because I think, personally, Costa Rica is the favorites to win the inter playoffs. Fourth place, even though there's still a slight chance of getting third, which we'll talk about, are you satisfied with it? Yeah, I think you have to be. When you look back as to how the, the campaign started and really slow start, you know, six points from six games. And it was more the, the vibe around the country where we felt a little bit hopeless, not in the sense that the points that we, we were dropping at home and, you know, the opportunities that we were dropping on these away trips. It was more so a sense of we were all looking around like, what are we doing here? You know, we called up Alvaro Saborio, we called up, Christian Bolaños, Brian Ruiz was starting most of our matches, and it, it just felt like we were holding on to a generation that was already in the works of moving past in 2018. That this is the one, this this campaign, we, we should have moved on to the next generation by now. But you know, our, our coaching changes, we had uh, Ronald Gonzalez that stepped in, and then you know uh, Luis Fernando Suarez takes over just before the Gold Cup, and it just it was a sense of we felt lost. So to to go from that, and everybody had us dead and buried. Uh, you know, Panama was was getting all these accolades for potentially doing something that, in all honesty, you guys should have seen that Panama was gonna was gonna falter. This this is a, this is their DNA. They did it in 2013. They would have done it in 2017 had it not been for a phantom goal, and they did it again in this campaign in Costa Rica. We're we're built for this. The, these these qualifying campaigns for the last you know 20 years. This is something that that we take great pride in. So to be able to feel a sense of hopelessness and out of nowhere seemingly jump automatically to fourth and you know we we, do, we still have to play new zealand and you want to respect your opponent but you do consider we, we will be the favorite to win that game it does feel like we at least accomplished something so there is a sense of yeah we'll take it what was the turning point in this campaign for costa rica what would you say was the turning point because there was like we said a lot of the the people in the beginning including myself didn't think los ticos would make it to the World Cup, and there was a point during the campaign that it actually seemed like you guys really weren't going to make it, but you guys really bounced back lately. What was the turning point? It was just experience. What changed? No, so it, you you take it back to that USA game uh, again. We called up Saburio, we called up Christian Bolaños, you know, 39, 37 years old, and we weren't relying on the talent that should have taken us to Qatar. So after that USA game, Luis Fernando Suarez, uh, along with the federation, who started a commission, what basically what they started doing were holding these microcycles where in, in Spanish was translated to, but basically mini camps. And Suarez, what he started to do was work with La Primera in, in Costa Rica, the first division, and start working with the clubs and bringing players into these mini camps so he can work with them, you know, in six to eight day cycles and start, start to figure out, okay, this kid, I like this kid, start to bring him in. And every window, it seemed like there was a game where one of those players that was in one of those mini camps had their moment. Houston Salas had his moment in Mexico. Anthony Contreras just had his moment in El Salvador. Uh, you know, we, we still have a couple of players that are going to have their opportunity to, to get their moment against the United States. We can talk about that later. But just the opportunity for him to kind of bridge that gap where a lot of people had us pegged for that 2014 generation, the 34, 35, 36-year-olds. 
and there was more of a reliance on you know a lot of these 20 24 and under players getting their opportunity to to really show out for the national team and and less of a reliance like brian ruiz is is a, a pretty controversial player for us you know even when you listen to the broadcast i can tell that the broadcaster has nothing in terms of information on our national teams because they're still bringing up ryan reese but you look at the first six games he played 350 minutes six points his minutes got cut significantly uh the, the windows that followed you know i think after about six games after that he only played about 150 minutes and, and we collected about 10 points so you mentioned brian ruiz i remember that recovery from miles robinson against the us that brian ruiz is just going on his own and miles just blasts through and takes the ball from him with so much ease just using athleticism because brian ruiz is far past his prime by now yeah we know that it's he's basically relied on now is more of like a second half substitute but that that wasn't the case to to start the world cup qualifying campaign and it all goes back to that usa game that was real, the real turning point you look at the last six games we got five wins and one draw and the the player pool looks a lot more like it should have to start now one question here about that uh would you say it's a lot of competence from the federation and the coach then they played a big role in this no because i don't want to give them too much credit for putting out a fire that they started right i think costa rica i felt i felt a lot of optimism when gustavo matosas took took over and i look back to that gold cup game that we played against mexico i think it was the quarterfinal game where i think it finished 2-2 and they went to penalties but it was his philosophy his style of play and then the 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 next generation that was coming up and the way that all those pieces were going to were going to combine i felt very optimistic and then he quit because he decided that national team soccer is boring so we went on a year with gonzalez kind of wasting our time a lot of the, the selections that he was making didn't make any sense so we picked on luis fernando suarez and, and really we only hired him because he gets results it, it's not it's not a long-term play you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, he got us qualified, so we should think about him for the next next cycle. No, this was short term. We're in a hole here. Dig us out of it. And it took them a little bit longer to, to really dig themselves out of it. But that was more out of stubbornness. You know, that this this identifying of players that we needed to rely on these these last eight games, that should have been like right after the Gold Cup. It, it shouldn't have taken this long. So credit to them for having the self-awareness and and what their shortcomings were but it was still of their own doing so i, I don't want to give them too much credit got it and uh, i find that fascinating because us us fans too we go through that quite a bit right of the the we're getting some results and it seems like it's credit to the federation or to greg when you look at it they kind of created the whole mess that happens yeah. a lot of time I have a question for you six zero is it possible is it gonna happen Nah, never gonna happen. And like I said, it's not Luis Fernando Suarez is, is the most conservative man I have ever known in life. This is a dude that probably reads every word of his terms and conditions before he hits I agree. So I don't I don't expect him to push for it, but that's mainly because we have a lot of players that are on yellows and those are gonna carry over into the, the Confederation playoff, which I think is ridiculous because the European playoffs, FIFA already, they announced well in advance that if you had a yellow going into the playoffs, they're going to be wiped clean. So you didn't have to worry about that. That's not the case here. So we have a few players that are basically right down our spine and, and really important players for us that we're going to need for New Zealand. So they're going to come out we're talking about Francisco Calvo. Um, Brian Oviedo is going to be important now that Matarita is going to be out. Joel Campbell is going to be out because of a potential suspension. And Celso Borges is one of the older generation players that I, I admittedly was a little bit too harsh on and he he really was a critical piece for us i expect that he's going to be out too because we just want to protect these guys so in terms of the pragmatism a lot of key players coming out you know less of a chance you're going to try and push for a six nothing you're, you're really going to play for the for the playoff in the future and would you just on a yes or no answer would you say even the costa rican soccer fans do they even do they even care at this point or they're just more Let's just go play this game. Whatever happens, happens. And we're more worried about that game against Oceania, which we don't know. I think it's going to be New Zealand. We Probably don't know New yet. Zealand, yeah. yeah. No, we care. The answer is yes, we care. So you're not going to give this game away. That's what no. I'm trying to say. No. Yeah. The U.S., even if we want to win for the first time there at Stadio Nacional, we're going to have to work for it. You would say mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a pride thing for us. Yeah. So 
Last but not least, I want to just now, this for the U.S. fans in general, you to give us a predicted starting 11 for Costa Rica, a score prediction too, and I'll give my predicted starting 11 for Greg, even though I don't know what Greg will do. It's a little, this game is very shady and confusing of what will happen because of all the things you already pointed out and Costa Rica having to win 6-0, which like you said, it's almost just kind of like, who gives a crap at this point about yeah. that? Let's just go to win for our pride. What is going to be the starting 11 for Costa Rica in formation, first formation, and then the starting 11, in your opinion? I would hope it's it's uh, a 4 2 3 1 shape. And because we're, we're going to try and still get a result, the 4 2 3 1 shape out of possession is going to look more like a 4 4 2 low block with the 10 pushing a little bit higher next to the nine. So I, I, I kind of put the 11 thinking of experience uh, at the back and then some experimental young pieces in wider and more central areas uh, up further up uh, up the field. So Kayla Navas in goal, he's not one of the players that's potentially going to get suspended, so he's definitely going to be at the start there. The center back position, we're going to rely on two players. We basically had a core of three. With, when Duarte went out, it's been Calvo, Juan Pablo Vargas, and Kendall Waston. Take Calvo out, I think it's easy to just plug and play Kendall Watson and Juan Pablo Vargas together. Uh, you have a natural left-footed and right-footed center back combination. And there. they play where? They play in the Costa Rican League? Well, Watson plays uh, for Saprisa, and then uh, Juan Pablo Vargas plays for Millonarios in, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So the fullbacks is, is really where we get a little bit experimental, guys that you guys have no idea who they are. Uh, Carlos Martinez made his debut in the second half against El Salvador, plays fullback for, for San Carlos, and admittedly, the system that they play at San Carlos is, is more of like a five-man back line, so he plays kind of like an inverted wingback because they don't have a left-back position there. But he's a natural fit for right back for us. And then on the left side, we have this young kid, Ian Lawrence, from Alajuelense. I think he's 19. He's, he's a part of the, I think, the U-20 setup. I expect him to get uh, significant minutes there if we're going to try to protect Oviedo at, at, at left back. So some experimental pieces in, in defense out wide. Centrally, with Borges out, uh, I expect Orlando Gallo or Houston Salas to get a run out there. I would hope it's Salas because I'm, I'm more of a fan of his game. Uh, and then I think he pairs a little bit nicely with Yeltsin Tejeda at midfield. So that'll kind of be your double pivot. Uh, and then just in front of him is a 18 year old kid, Brandon Aguilera, which I'm really excited about right now. He plays for Juan Azteca on loan from Alajuelense and, uh, you know, real creative type 10 mold can drop really deep into midfield, can be a deep line playmaker if you need him. Uh, but also he's also very capable in carrying the ball and going one V one on his own has a wicked left foot can take it from distance. So I'm really excited for this to potentially be his moment. And it makes sense to put him in this system because you have Contreras with Campbell out likely playing at the nine. And those two, they, they've they been killing it in the in the Costa Rican league together for Juan Acasteca. So it's a, it's a natural fit. And then out wide, you know, Alonso Martinez kind of uh, looked look decent for the first time. So I expect him to be back out there on the wing. And I'd like to see Gerson Torres, who for me was the MVP of last season for Herediano, uh, he's the one who created the assist for the goal against Canada. I like to see him uh, go back out there and get a run. He wasn't dressed for the game in El Salvador, and I don't know why. I haven't seen anything on it, but my hope is that he returns to the lineup. And I think when you look at that setup, it's you know down the down the spine. It's it's pretty uh, it's pretty experienced and out in in the dangerous areas. You have a lot of nice young attacking pieces that we can try to utilize. So you're pretty excited to see this lineup, actually. Yeah, because it's, it's young guys. You know, it's it's what I've been clamoring for for months. I felt like I was screaming into an echo chamber. But to to see a lot of these pieces finally get put out there and finally get them their minutes, it's it's what I've been saying is was going to happen. It just it took a little bit longer. Is there any of these young guys, before I tell you my starting 11 for the U.S. that I think will go, is there any of these young guys that you think could possibly, we could possibly see them in MLS in the near future or in Europe Any that you think are very talented? Yeah, I think Contreras and Aguilera are two that, that definitely stand out. Gerson Torres is probably the most, uh, I would say out of all of them, he's probably the most prolific and has the, the highest ceiling. And I would expect him to, to potentially move to Europe at some point. He signed Isn't with... Isn't he a bit older? He's, a he's bit like older 24. Now. He's 24. Yeah. But uh, he signed with an agent that, that's pretty pretty infamous for getting, uh, you know, getting guys out of Costa Rica and, and into the, some of the European leagues. So I, I expect him to, to get a move. Other than that, you know, it's still, I think it's still too early to tell with some of these fullbacks on where they are. They kind of have to prove themselves, but I think these other pieces are, are pretty ready for it. Okay. So I think I'm going to tell you Greg's lineup that I think he'll go. Okay. It could be completely different. Who knows? I think he's going to keep Zach Stefan on goal. 
DeAndre Yedlin should be back on the right back. And I think he's going to keep the 4-3-3 that the U.S. has been playing so far. Very standard 4-3-3. A six, dual eights, two wingers, whipping crosses. Uh, Aaron Long and Miles Robinson, I think, will be defenders. He pulled Miles out of the game last game. He was on a yellow, so I'm assuming he plans on playing Miles. And he might give Zimmerman a little bit of a rest. So the left back, he might rest um, Anthony Robinson because he played two games in a row. So we might see a little bit of George Bellow. The midfield, Tyler Adams, not suspended. I think he'll start. And then he's probably going to go with Kel Costa and Luca De La Torre. I was hoping for Reyna, but I don't think Reyna will play central. Reyna will either start on the right wing. It will be Reyna or Weya on the right wing. Now, as for Yunus Musa, he kind of gassed out last two games, to be honest, even Mexico. So Musa probably won't start. Could see minutes in the second half. Pulisic, I think he'll play. He was subbed off early against Panama. Had a hat trick. And I think he'll go with Pifak up top. Uh, Pifak. So just to recap, Zach Steffen, Yedlin, Long, Miles Robinson, George Bello, Tyler Adams, Kellen Acosta, Luca De La Torre, Tim Weya, or Reyna, Pulisic, and Pifak. So with this lineup, what is your score prediction for this game? Is the United States finally going to beat Costa Rica? This seems like the perfect storm for the United States to finally get this win. Not going to happen. No, I, th- oh. I still think I still think it's a pride thing for us. You know, even if we get this win, if you really think about it, we'll we'll likely still finish in fourth unless it's an absolute catastrophe, which I don't anticipate. But it's still when you look at the table, we'll be level both of us on what twenty five, and I think mm-hmm. that that stands for something for us. I we were we were pretty we were pretty heavily impacted by COVID and this last window was the first time that we were at a hundred percent at the Salio Nacional. Canada felt it in the first half and they were down to 10 men. And I feel like we, as a nation, we, we still want to hold serve here. The only team that's been able to really beat us here has been Mexico. And I think we want to keep it that way. So it's, it's a weird game. It has weird vibes. I, I still feel like we're going to try and get a result. I don't know. I don't think that it'll be three points only because of the weirdness of it, where we both really don't need it. And we're kind of going through the motions. Curious to see how the young kids play. But, you know, nil, nil, one, one draw, I feel is is probably where, where we end up. Low scoring draw then. Yeah. So I don't I don't know. I'm going to since I forced you to give a prediction, I'll give one as well. Uh, but obviously, I want to see the lineup of the United States because Greg could go with um, many different players and. It can change the way I see this, but oh goodness, I'm actually gonna do similar to yours. I'm gonna say one-one. I think we'll see mm-hmm. goals. That'll happen, but one-one uh, because at the end of the day, a uh, one-one draw, both teams will be fairly okay with it, right? Costa Rica stays undefeated there. They got fourth. The United States gets a draw away against Costa Rica, which we know how hard it is. I think we lost four-zero last cycle there, right? Yeah, four-zero. Yeah, it was four-zero. So, I mean, 4-0 is kind of close to 6, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be a close, tight game. The U.S. will be conservative as well, and I'm going for 1-1. So, similar to yours, you said 0-0, 1-1. Eddie, thank you very much for coming along. You're very knowledgeable in Costa Rica and just soccer in general. So, thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, everyone, that does it for this episode. Hopefully, you enjoyed the last preview of World Cup qualifying here at the channel in 2022 in this cycle, and we will be in Qatar, and I'm looking very much forward to it. I'll see you all at the live watch-along this Wednesday, the last one of World Cup qualifying. Then we're going to have Nations League and a lot more throughout the year. Exciting times. Exciting times. This great generation the United States has has a lot to look forward to this year of 2022. I want to thank you all very much for watching. Don't forget to smash the like button right now if you made it this far in the video. Thank you for watching and have a great day.